I thought you were writing an article. Yes, yes, I'm writing an article. So why do you need to record me? They're just for notes. It means I can focus on the conversation at hand. Oh, so is it recording now? I've just started it. What do you want me to say? Just tell your story, your connection to Loch Ness, and how you came to be here, in your own words. Well, I don't know. I guess it all started when I was a little girl. I loved my mum and my dad, but I'm not altogether sure they left me back. Sometimes they did. Sometimes they were amazing parents. I mean that genuinely. I'm not just saying it. Sometimes I could see the love they had for me. I have some great memories from when I was really young. of The four of us. The four of you? Yes. I had a little brother. I wasn't aware. Well, that's when things changed. He got very ill and he had to go into hospital. And I wasn't allowed to visit him, which made me very cross. But they kept telling me I'd be allowed to see him when he came out of the hospital. But... But he never did? Exactly. Which just made me even more angry. I didn't think it was very fair. They'd got to be with him. They'd got to share his last moments. I hadn't seen him in months. He was just as much part of my life as he was theirs. I'm really sorry. And I started acting out. It was as if somehow, in my mind, if I could rebel against my parents hard enough, they would eventually have to give in and turn back time, give me a chance to say goodbye properly. But that's not what happened, of course. They were really patient with me at first. But while I didn't know it at the time, looking back now, I realised they had turned to alcohol to deal with his death. And whenever they had been drinking, and I would be doing something mischievous, they had a habit of losing their temper. So I started making a real effort to behave more, always being polite, trying really hard at school, never making a sound. But it didn't make any difference. The violence didn't stop. The only way I had of escaping the torture they inflicted upon me was to leave. But I was so young, I couldn't go off into the world on my own. All I had was the lake. We lived not on the shore of Lake Loch Ness, but certainly within walking distance. My parents, I don't think, didn't realise just how lucky they were to have all this on their doorstep. I'm not sure anybody in the village did. And as a result, it wasn't until I moved away that I realised just how special it really was. Just how special it had always been to me, even as a little girl. And when did you move away? I moved into foster care when I was 12 years old. But there was something else. Something else when I was younger. Sorry. And that was? It didn't come back to me until I was in my late twenties. They often say if you've had an abusive childhood, then there'll be big gaps in your memory. Times when your brain had to shut itself off to handle the stress. I can't say for sure whether that's true or not, but it would certainly make sense because I didn't remember it until then. And by that point you had a son? Yes, that's true. And a husband. You were still with your husband at that point? To tell you the truth, I can't be sure. I believe I was, but I wouldn't want you to count on it because my memory of that time is pretty hazy. Funnily enough, I've had a much clearer memory of the memory that had been gone for 20 years than I do of what was actually happening to me at the time. And what memory was that? It came back to me while I was watching a documentary. It mentioned Nessie. Someone was describing what they had seen. And suddenly I realised I had seen her too. The Loch Ness Monster? Yes, not just once. Many, many times on those numerous excursions. Escapes, you might call them. Escapes from the daily torture my parents inflicted upon me. What did you see? Almost like a whale or a dolphin or a dinosaur even. And I just remember it towering over me, much bigger than any of those things. Of course, I would have been six years old at the time, so my sense of size would have been altered accordingly. So, what happened next? I have no idea. It was just that memory. Sorry, I didn't mean when you were six. I meant in your twenties, when these memories came back to you. What, what did you do afterwards? Oh, I see. Well, I took my husband and son up to Loch Ness, just for a visit, you know. I didn't tell my son. He was only three years old, so I don't think he would have understood anyway. But I did tell John, my husband, about Nessie. He smiled, but I could tell he didn't believe me, which hurt. I think he was just relieved I was willing to revisit the place where I'd grown up. 
We'd spent so long avoiding it at my own insistence. I think he saw this as a first step towards me coming to terms with my past. We didn't see my parents though. John and my son only came to the lake the first two times. After that, they decided to explore the area further. But I spent the entire time walking around the lake, waiting. And did you see the monster? Sadly not. After two weeks, we had to return back down south. Not long after, my, my parents passed away. Due to a lack of a will, the house went to me. I knew what John would say. He would think I was crazy to go back to the place where all that had happened to me. He would tell me I should sell it. Besides, he couldn't give up his job because I wanted to move away. But you did so anyway. Of course, I didn't even tell him. I couldn't leave Nessie behind. You really just left him for the monster? I, I suppose so. And that's all you've done since? Chase the monster? I'm not chasing it. I'm waiting for it to appear to me again, as it did when I was a little girl. And what about your son? I've not heard from him since. And you blame him for that? I don't blame anybody. I'm fine with it. And as he hasn't tried to get in touch with me, I'm guessing he is as well. There must be some deeper reason you felt you needed to leave your husband. It wasn't about leaving him. It was about coming here. You know, I've spent the last 30 years of my life hating you. Hating you for leaving me with him. What? I can see now things were more complicated than that. You clearly went through some things as a child and it clearly affected you in some way. I don't understand what you're talking about. But I still don't believe you came here to find a monster that deep down you know you never saw. And you know, doesn't actually exist. You came here to escape him. You came here because you'd had to escape before and you had to escape again. And I can't blame you for that. But I do blame you for one thing. Leaving me with him. Putting me through exactly the same as what you went through as a child. You knew who he was and yet you abandoned me. Your son with that man. You're my son. Biologically. Are you really a journalist? No. What do you do? That's not important. Then why are you here? I came here because I wanted to understand. I wanted to understand why you abandoned me. And I'm still not sure I do. I'm so sorry. You know, I have children of my own now. You do? A boy and a girl. Can I meet them? There is nothing. I wouldn't do for them. James, I want to meet them. And I would never, ever abandon them with someone I knew to be an abuser. The thought makes me sick. Please, can I meet them? I can't understand how you did it. I'm sorry, James. I am. I really am. Then tell me why you did it. For Nessie. Tell me! It was all for Nessie. Why? Why can't you tell me? She's here, somewhere, waiting for me to return. Why did you leave me with him? And someday, I'll find her again. Someday. Monster Hunter was written by Joe Dolan and directed by Jennifer Fernandez, with Nilgan Derenke as Sally and Jack Matthews as James. Edited by Joe Dolan, an Insight Playwright production. I knew it, I knew it. That's why you wouldn't tell me anything about him, isn't it? Mum, what are you on about? Him! That's just left. Your biker friend? In court? I knew it! What exactly do you think you know, Mother? Oh, the minute I laid eyes on him, I knew he was a criminal. All those nasty tattoos and that long hair. Mum, what are you talking about? Is that why you wouldn't tell me anything about him, Laura? 
I told you he was a nice man, and that was enough for you to know. A pack of lies, obviously. No, Mother, it was not. I don't appreciate you talking about Justin like this. You never even gave him a chance. You saw what you wanted and made up your mind. I think I know a good man when I see one at my age. Well, from past experience, I don't think you can. That's not fair. You know yourself I didn't have a clue about Thomas. He hid it very well. You should have known. How? His job took him to the other end of the country regularly. I had to trust him and he never gave me a reason not to. We were together for nearly 20 years and he was always so attentive when he was with me. You were as shocked as me when it all came out. I wasn't married to the man, Laura. You just missed all the signs. You know what? We are not having this conversation. Thomas was good to me, but he was also good to his other wife. Neither of us knew about the other and neither of us had any reason to suspect. It had nothing to do with being a bad judge of character. You tell yourself that. I will because it's true. You're being unfair and discriminatory towards Justin. I am not. I only want what's best for you. And you don't think that Justin is good for me because he happens to have a motorbike and a couple of tattoos. Oh, and don't forget the long hair and the fact that I overheard you talking about him being in court tomorrow. I am seriously wondering why you bothered to visit me. All you have done since you came is criticise everything I do. I thought you'd be happy for me. Happy? That you're dating a criminal? Justin is not a criminal. He is. Oh, really? So he is one of those people that are always innocent of their crimes. Sorry, Judge. Can't remember. I was drinking or I was on drugs. My mommy didn't call me in time, so I had to speed to get to work. And the woman was too slow crossing the road. It wasn't my fault. They left the door wide open. I was just making sure everything was all right. Oh, the computer fell into my pocket. All the excuses, never their fault. Always someone else's or the drink and the drugs. No one taking responsibility for their actions. Mum, that's enough. You cannot come in here spouting of rubbish you know nothing about. Oh, really? Well, he's the one who said he didn't do it. They all say that, you know. Because sometimes people are wrongfully accused. I'd like to see the statistics on that. I'd say they're pretty low. Anyway, the jury will take one look at him and know he did it. Why would you say that? Look at him. Tattoos, driving a huge motorbike. You do know that you are stereotyping him by the way he looks today. I'm right, though. I'm sure that the jury will see what I see. I certainly hope not, or we're going to be in some trouble. <laughs> What's so funny? Maybe you should come to the court with me tomorrow. Why would I want to do that? To see for yourself what happens. Watching him getting away with whatever he's done. Maybe you'll learn a thing or two. What's that supposed to mean? All my life, you have undermined everything I've done, making me out to be stupid and not make right decisions. When I found out about Thomas, I just wanted your support. I got more support from Thomas's other wife than I did from you. That's not fair. I've spent my whole life worrying about you. It never ends, you know. You always want the best for your children. There has to be a time when you trust that I can make my own decisions that I have a good judge of character. Justin is a good man. Laura, he's a biker with long hair and tattoos. And now you're going to court to see him go to prison. I'll be there with you tomorrow because I want you to see that I'm right. I'm sorry, excuse me, sorry. Excuse me, excuse me. Well? Where is he? I'm sure he'll be out soon. I'm doing this for your own good, Laura. You are so trusting, and then you get walked all over. You don't need a criminal like Justin in your life. Justin is not a criminal, and he is funny and kind. I wish you had just sat down and had a chat to him, got to know him before you jumped to conclusions. 
I didn't jump to conclusion. I heard the two of you yesterday saying you didn't know what the jury were thinking. I suppose he's down in the cells before the judge comes in. Oh, look, there's the jury now. I'd be good at that, you know, that jurying thing. No, you would not. Of course I would. I can tell by the look of someone what they're like. No, you can't. Really, Laura? I knew by the look of Justin he was a criminal, and I'm about to be proven right. All oh, rise for presiding judge, his honour, Judge Shaw. Court is now in session. <coughs> Mother, are you all right? Maybe we should go outside. Why didn't you tell me? Tell you what? You did that on purpose to make a show of me. Mother, you are well capable of making a show of yourself. He's the judge. I know. I called him a criminal. I know. He's the judge. But he has tattoos and long hair and he drives a motorbike. I know. Well, then how can he be a judge? Many people drive motorbikes because they prefer to travel that way. And many people, men and women, have tattoos. I have one. You do not. I do. And so does your sister, Jean. She does not. She's 70 years of age and a retired teacher, for God's sake. Teachers don't have tattoos. Many people have tattoos. That does not make them bad people. You have to stop this. Judging people before you get to know them. Sorry. What did you say? I said I was sorry. And I will apologise to his honour, Judge Shaw, when he's finished. You can call him Justin. Judging a Book by Its Cover was written by Carol Long and directed by Jennifer Fernandez with Lucinda Kelly as Victoria and Nilgan Durenke as Laura. Edited by Joe Dolan and Insight Playwrights Production. It's me, love. Thought you might want to lift home. I'm not done yet. Oh, okay. I don't mind waiting for a bit. I don't know how long I'm going to be. Oh, okay. I brought you a decaf oat marshmallow latte. Thought you might need warming up. Here you go. Oh, hang on. That's my hot chocolate. This one's yours. Come in, then. Wow. What is all this stuff? These are digital sound recorders. That's a night vision camera, and there's another one up there near the staircase. And what are these? EMF meters. Of course they are. Paranormal activity can cause fluctuations in electromagnetic fields, so these can be a good indicator of a presence. Ah, I see. Ghost detectors. If you like. Who pays for all this? Most of it's Kieran's. Wow. Well, that's nice. His parents must be really supportive. He does make some money from his YouTube channel. And from working in the dry cleaners, I suppose. Where is he tonight, anyway? He went to pick up some two-way radios from a friend. The phone signal isn't great in here. Are you on your own? Where's everyone else from Ghost Club? It's the Paranormal Investigation Society. They've all got other commitments tonight. Watching football beats watching for ghosts, eh? Not that it was much of a match. Can I help with anything as I'm here? You could go and tape that cable down over there. Sure, we can't have the ghosts tripping up and suing us now, can we? Once we get all of this set up, what happens next? We take a walk around with one of the EMF meters and see if we can pick anything up. If we find an area with strong activity, we can move some of the other equipment to make sure we capture anything. Shall we give it a go then? I don't think we should without Kieran being here. Does he have first dibs on all the ghosts? No, it's just that it's his equipment. He seems fine leaving you to set it all up. Yes. So he must trust you with it? He does. Have you ever seen a ghost? No, but I feel I'm quite close. 
Kieran says it just takes practice. How do you go about practicing? You have to put yourself in places of high paranormal activity and then try to tune to the vibrations and the energy. Okay, so you've got more chance of seeing a ghost if you really want to and put a bit of effort in. Yes. I see. Has Kira never seen a ghost? Yeah, loads. He's a really sensitive person. Is he? I don't think he'd object if we have a little look around just to practice, would he? I suppose not. Let's take one of the detector things. So what's the story with this place? Well, there's been quite a few reports of paranormal activity. Have there? It used to be a schoolhouse before they made it the community centre. One time Mrs Burns came to set up for the parents and toddler group and all the yoga mats were scattered on the floor as if somebody had kicked the whole pile over. Could they have just slipped? Well, somebody who wasn't very receptive might believe that. So we could be dealing with a ghost that has a grudge against yoga? Maybe. Anything? Not yet. It's colder in here though, isn't it? Can you feel it? Yes, but maybe it's because I've finished my hot chocolate. I think we should move one of the voice recorders in here. Okay, I'll help you. Is there anybody else in the group who's as sensitive as Kieran then? Martha reckons she is, but I think she exaggerates. Does she? Yeah. She says she saw a ghost in the bowling alley. What, in Top Lane's bowling? Yeah, in the toilets. But that was only after Kieran said he felt a strong presence in the building. Really? Yeah. He said he felt there were entities making the bowling balls veer off course. Some ghosts are very sensitive to noise, so they're probably just trying to stop the pins getting knocked down. Or maybe Kieran's just crap at bowling. And that's why you've never seen a ghost. How do you know? Have you? Well, actually... I think I told you I used to work as a cleaner at a hospital when I was in college. Yeah. Well, I was in the main reception one night. This was in the old building. It's all offices in there now, but there were still a couple of wards on the ground floor then. So I'm there with my headphones on, listening to my music, and cleaning the floor with one of those big buffing machines, you know. Yeah, go on. I see a figure out the corner of my eye. Turn round and it's an old lady. An elderly patient. She's obviously given the nurses the slip and gone for a bit of a wonder. I go over and ask her if she's alright and she says, I'm looking for that young doctor. He's making me a cup of tea. I say, well let's go and see if he's in the kitchen. And she says, but he came this way. Anyway, I convince her to walk 